Chapter 2, being the true story of how humans first began to fish and how fishing became an industry. Nor ought we to think that the occasional destruction of an animal of any particular color would produce little effect. Charles Darwin on the Origin of Species. Page 22. Once the order of nature is understood, that all life struggles for survival and is interconnected with the rest of life, it becomes clear that fishermen taking fish from the sea always had an impact on marine life. Page 23. When the destruction of fish was moderate, the impact was moderate, and the small adjustments made by nature usually were not even noticed. It is only when the destruction of fish takes place on a large scale that we start to see enormous change in the order of sea life. Before human beings could write down their history, they recorded their lives by drawing pictures, often on the walls of caves. Most of these drawings illustrate the hunting of land animals. Only very rarely are fish depicted, but the fossilized remains of fish bones and fish hooks show that fishing, though not one of the first activities, began quite early. Fish lines and nets were made from vegetable fibers. Hooks were made from bones. Fish were also sometimes speared, and if you ever tried this, you will see that it takes tremendous skill to get only one fish. Fishing was a game of fishermen tricking fish, finding new and better ways to catch fish. The fisherman who caught the most fish was the best fisherman, and the richest one. Throughout history, until 15 to 20 years ago, fishermen saw their job as doing whatever they could to catch as many fish as possible. But they understood that the secret of their game was to catch as many fish as they could while still maintaining a prosperous fish population in their fishing grounds. Page 24. They knew that if they fished too much, the fish would all swim away. They worried that putting out too many nets would keep the fish from coming in. And they also understood that taking too many fish, small, young fish, would destroy the population. Unlike humans and other mammals, fish continue to grow bigger throughout their lives. The bigger the fish, the more eggs it can lay, and the more young fish it will produce. So it is important to allow small fish to grow large. Even a thousand years ago, fishermen understood this. Page 25. Until modern times, fishermen and fishing communities worried most about migratory fish. These fish usually live in the middle level of the ocean as opposed to ground fish that live on or near the ocean floor. Herring is an example of a migratory fish. It was an extremely important fish to northern Europe in the Middle Ages because back then, before refrigeration, fish that were most valuable were those that could be preserved well in salt. Herring was such a fish. It could be pickled in salt water, put in barrels, and if packed well, these barrels could be shipped to faraway places. A village might fish for herring in a nearby area for 20 years, always bringing in huge numbers of fish. And then suddenly, the fish would be gone, plunging the once prosperous village into poverty. What happened to the herring? In the Middle Ages, it was often believed that God had sent the herring away as punishment for people living immoral lives. When a village lost their school of herring, it was disgraced. Some took a more scientific view, at least for those times. They feared that fishermen, farther out in the ocean, were using too many nets, and the herring were not able to swim into their fishing grounds. Netting was always seen as dangerous. Page 26. But in reality, what probably had happened was that subtle shifts in the order of nature had taken place. As Darwin noted, migration is an important factor. The herring that live in the middle level of the ocean might have abandoned their fishing grounds because too many of the fish at the bottom of the ocean which ate herring had moved into the area. Or the herring might have gone because the smaller fish that they ate were leaving and they followed them in search of food. Or maybe too many birds had driven the herring away, or had driven some other types of fish that ate the same things as herring into the herring fishing grounds, which in turn had driven the herring away. Or it just might have been a combination of all these factors put together over time. 
It was in the 19th century that fishermen first started to play a major role in the shifts and the natural order of the sea. Not until then did the changes fishermen were making in the sea become threatening to the entire order of life. The real trouble began when the invention of engine power was applied to commercial fishing. Page 27. Thomas Savory, an English military engineer and inventor, patented the first steam engine in 1698. Savory was trying to pump water out of coal mines. His machine consisted of a closed vessel filled with water, into which steam was injected under pressure. It seems a simple device, but it employed a world-changing idea. Heat applied to water creates steam that pushes outward, creating the energy to move objects. Steam engines were not used on ships until a century later, though, and even then, this technology was not applied to fishing. Fishermen tend to be problem solvers by nature, and until there is a problem to solve, they are not particularly interested in new technology, although once there is a problem to solve, they can be extremely innovative. Page 28. Because the most productive fishing grounds in the world at the time, those of the North Atlantic, yielded so many fish for the fishermen, even though they were on sailing ships that were wind-powered, there was no reason for them to switch to engine-powered ships. In fact, sail power worked so well for fishing that in New England, it was used until the 1950s. Even today, sail power is still used by fishermen in poor countries. It was in the North Sea in the late 19th century that innovations in fishing began to take place. The North Sea is a body of water rich in fish, which is surrounded by the great European fishing nations, such as Scotland, England, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, Sweden, and Norway. Throughout history, these nations competed with one another for fish and fishing territories. Some of these countries have even gone to war over it. Holland and England battled over North Sea herring during the Anglo-Dutch Wars of the 17th century. France and England fought over North American cod in the early 18th century during the Queen Anne's War. For centuries, North Sea nations kept bringing in larger and larger catches, with little sign of any decline in the supply of fish. In the early 17th century, the Dutch had 2,000 ships in the North Sea fishing for herring. Top of page 29. The British responded by banning foreign fishing vessels within 14 miles of the British coastline. This was the distance visible from the top of a mast. It was the British that first started using a beam trawler in the 14th century, also called a wondrichome. This was a net suspended from a beam and dragged through the sea. Diagram of a sail-powered vessel dragging a beam trawl. It was fishermen themselves who first spoke out about the dangers of using beam trawlers to catch fish. In 1376, they petitioned the British Parliament to pass a law banning their use because the nets swept up fish indiscriminately, taking many immature young fish. Parliament did not institute a ban. Then, in the 17th century, Scottish fishermen petitioned Charles I to protect fishing from, quote, the great destruction made of fish by a net or engine, now called the trawl. Page 30. The problem with beam trawlers was that sailing ships didn't have the power to haul huge nets. If the nets were too large and caught too many fish, they would be too heavy to pull, so they had to use small ones. On the other hand, beam trawlers were quite efficient in other ways. The potential of dragging a net through the water and hauling up everything in its path had obvious advantages over setting lines with baited hooks. In addition to requiring no bait, a beam trawler seemed certain to haul in a much higher percentage of the fish it passed. By 1774, beam trawling had become one of the principal fishing techniques in the North Sea. In the mid-19th century, new ideas were aimed at improving the quality of fish and of getting the fish to market fresher. Well boats came into use. These were ships that contained a tank of seawater into which the caught fish would be dumped, enabling fish to stay fresh longer than previously. This meant that fishermen could remain at sea, fishing for a longer period of time. 
Once the quality of fish improved in England, and most notably in London, the demand for fish rapidly increased. Page 31. Then, in 1848, a new dramatic technological advance was created in the port of Grimsby on the North Sea at the mouth of the Humber River. A rail connection straight to London. Because it was a large port capable of storing ice from not too distant Norway, ice was essential for keeping fish fresh on its way to market, the port of Grimsby became a premier port for quality fish in London. In 1881, the Zodiac, the first vessel built for dragging fishing nets under steam power, was launched from Grimsby. The first locomotive passes through the port of Grimsby. Illustrated London Newsprint Library Collection, 1848.